how much money would it take you to punch your mom in the face? What is the well, low? Uh, <laughs> Twelve dollars. bucks. <laughs> Enough to buy a Subway no. sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> this podcast contains explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Thundercast. My name is Christian. My name is Lucas. And I'm Liam, here with another podcast that just talks about movies. That's right. Today we are coming to you live from uh, somewhere deep inside the recesses recesses of your mind. <laughs> no, we're, we're actually coming from the inner machinations of my mind. Oh, yeah. It might oh. be enigma. Yeah, like it's scary in there. <laughs> literally nothing is real. It's all just in Liam's brain. Anyway, yeah. and today we are sponsored by our patrons, and all of you will get a shout out at the end of the show. Uh, today we're going to be talking about our personal creative processes, which, yeah. um, in anticipation for the shift in uh, content creation that we're going to be doing uh, on the show, and or not the show on the channel. So get hyped for that. Anyway, yeah. or yeah, or maybe, uh, and also maybe talk about uh, things that stuck stuck out to us this year or attempt to because this was another pretty dumb year yeah that's true <laughs> anyway that's we'll way of it. jump right into the ingestion and uh, yeah. lucas why don't you go first sure uh first off i want to talk about uh, a book i recently finished uh because of course it wouldn't be an in uh, thunder lizard ingestion without <laughs> me talking about a book yep uh, I, re I recently finished the final book in the green bone saga uh, it's called Jade Legacy. Uh, for those who aren't aren't aware or don't remember when I talked about it last, the, uh, the Greenbone Saga is an urban fantasy, a more modern urban fantasy series that the author describes as the Godfather, but with kung fu and magic. <laughs> yes. Um, I finished the third book, and the third book is the finale, and uh, it was it was great. I loved it a lot. It was. Uh, it was. I it ended basically how I thought it would end, but mm -hmm. that's not necessarily a bad thing. I still enjoyed it. Um, it, it m for most of the way through it kept me guessing, shocked me a couple times, uh, made me cry, made me laugh. Why is Voldemort here? <laughs> <laughs> this is the wrong series. But uh, for anyone who uh, enjoys um, that kind of book, there's not really many other kinds of books, uh, or like there's not many other books that are of the same kind. But uh, if anyone is interested in urban fantasy or like uh, East Asian inspired settings or uh, sort of like crime drama sort of thing. Uh, I would highly recommend this series. Uh, I, I love it a lot. It's one of my favorite book series. I really hope they... Uh, there's apparently a, an adaptation of the saga coming to... I think it's Peacock at some point. Oh, yeah. And I hope they don't butcher it. <laughs> uh, secondly, um, I saw the new Spider-Man movie, No yeah. Way Home. Uh I kind of hated it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah. think you were going to love it at all. Well, more <laughs> I remember saying to you guys that I enjoyed it fine when we saw it, but like with the worst of any Marvel movies or movies like this, the more you th when you think about it for more than 10 minutes, you realize this fucking sucks. Yeah, like the 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 best way I can describe it is it um this is going to sound harsh uh, come from me, but it feels like season 8 of Game of Thrones because Everybody had to be had to drop like a thousand IQ points to make the plot work. Yep. Like everybody yep. had to be really fucking stupid for this story to happen. Yeah. Like, are you telling me that like the, like Peter Parker and Doctor Strange did not discuss the details of the spell at all before jumping into it? Nope. Like they didn't, they didn't talk about it at all. Peter didn't understand what the spell was. Doctor Strange didn't understand what Peter wanted. And they just sort of went along with it. Like these, these two, these, pe these two people are supposed to be geniuses. They like, literally the just go You're into the basement, and then it's just like, "All right, you ready for this?" <laughs> yeah, You're they don't discuss it at all. And then like, it, and then like, Peter's being a fucking idiot. When like they're trying to like capture all the all the villains and stuff, they're, it's like, "Oh, you're just gonna escort them to an apartment like with no guards or anything." With like, I it, like the the plot is so deeply contrived. That Nothing it was, really it happens. Bothered. Yeah, and, and like the end of the movie is stupid. It just uh, ends up being a soft reboot because instead of actually sticking to their convictions, even if some fans, even if I'm one of those fans who didn't care for what they were doing, just so they could soft reboot and, appe and appease the largest audience possible. Yeah, I will say the returning actors, for the most part, were a lot of fun, especially Willem Dafoe. 
I think Willem it's been Dafoe long enough. Most so people, like, I mean, everyone who has Omicron definitely saw Spider Man. Let's face it. <laughs> um, but uh, I think we can probably spoil it. Yeah. So when you say returning actors, who mm-hmm. exactly are you speaking about? <laughs> yeah, uh, the Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield show. What? Uh, what? <laughs> Really? The worst kept secret ever. Yeah, like I, I, like that was never spoiled for me. But I knew it was going to happen. Like yeah. they, they wouldn't make this movie if that wasn't going to happen. It was, it was so obvious to me. Um, but like, uh, like they, honestly, seeing them on screen again was fun. I'll, I'll, Even I'll say that. Toby Maguire is still a terrible, terrible actor. He's, he, I don't know if I agree. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't really think he but, wanted to be there. He just wanted the cool couple million dollars. Half the time, I couldn't tell if he was actually trying to give a, a specific performance for being back or if he just really did not want to be there. Yeah, he was just kind of there. Like, I don't know. I, I think he did fine for for what, like, what he was given. And, like, I, I enjoyed some of their banter. There was one really good scene. There was one pretty good scene involving Andrew Garfield. But, like, uh, for the most part, the movie, it, it just feels so empty. Them just like, doing like, SNL no... skits whenever we're on screen. Yeah, and like it, like the, there was nothing to take away from it. Like they tried to, like, ham, like horn, uh, like uh, shoehorn uh, a meaning about doing the right thing or whatever. But like it just, it, it just didn't feel earned at all. It, I don't understand why people love this movie so much. Yeah, I liked it fine. I don't think it's a fucking yeah, masterpiece um, at all. There's even just yeah. one. There's one other cameo which, uh, uh, was it? People are like, why are you so pissed about this? And maybe it's just because of. Uh, what is it? Well, it pisses me off for a few things. So another spoiler, Daredevil's in this movie, or Matt Murdock. For one mm. scene. <laughs> yeah, so there, yeah. there's two problems here. One, that does not sound, or that is not how Matt Murdock acts or talks. Two, you actually had an interesting setup here. They have this whole thing where it's like, oh, Spider-Man dealing with public with his public identity or whatnot and that getting out. Instead of actually dealing with that or following it up, oh no, the charges were just dropped. Yeah. When you yeah. read co- when you read a lot of uh, Marvel comics or whatnot, that's actually a lot of things they tend to go into, particularly with Spider Man and Matt Murdock. There was like a whole year long event where uh, it's Matt Murdock just trying to uh, help help Peter prove his innocence. Yeah. yeah, and also and also they made Matt Murdock just as stupid as everybody else yep. in the movie. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, the the best part of the movie, in my opinion, is Willem Dafoe returning 100%. as the Green Goblin. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Willem's review of it was pretty funny. He's uh, he just I th- what was it? He said um, they finally realized they're never gonna have a better villain than Willem Dafoe as the Green Goblin, so they're just like fuck it, bring him back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though I've always argued that the Green Goblin in the first Spider-Man movie isn't really a great, interesting, or well-written villain, he's just really well acted and fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. There's not not a whole lot about him that's like super interesting. He's a fine comic book villain, but Willem Dafoe makes him so memorable. Yeah. Um. Um, I guess also it was kind of endearing to see Andrew Garfield be genuinely happy to be back. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. that was like that Andrew was at Garfield. least in, yeah that was at least endearing. But mm-hmm. again, it's just such a nothing movie. Yeah, and the I way agree. they're written into the movie is so boring. Yeah, like, lazy. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, lazy. It's, just, it's like oh they're 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 here now. Mm, that's fine. That's literally it. That's just like there. There's really no explanation as to why Ned can open up portals to other dimensions. There's no yeah, there, explanation. There, there's like, there's a throwaway it. line at the beginning where he's like, "Oh, I got." He t- says, "Dark Strange." I have like tinglys in my finger or whatever. Yeah, but that's not and, enough to really. No, they, they they it was a throwaway line that what it was like it was technically set up and payoff, but barely. I don't know. I I really di- I really disliked No Way Home. I I it, it reminded me why I don't watch Marvel movies anymore. <laughs> yeah. <Yep. laughs> I think it's time to hang up the coat, you know. Yeah. Man. Yeah, I'm, I'm I it was it was bad. Yep. There are certain scenes I'll probably go back to, just all the Green Goblin scenes and the and the um Doc Ock scenes. He was fun too. Mm-hmm. Uh but yeah, that's that's my feelings on No Way Home. Great. Uh, I I feel I feel whenever I looked at I looked at the reviews, it's getting very good reviews. Mm-hmm. And I was I was kind of shocked. Uh, but speaking of movies that don't uh, match up with the reviews they're getting, uh, I watched I watched Don't Look Up. Me too. On Netflix, uh, I kind of loved that movie. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's getting such bad reviews. Yeah. I thought all the performances fun. in it were so much fun. I thought the satire was pretty funny. There's some jokes that didn't quite land, but like for the most part, I think they hit uh, well enough anyway. Um, some of the reviews are really strange. Because like the movie is very very specific in its satire, it's like yeah. it's like just 
it's demonst- it's like illustrating the absurdity of how people have reacted to things like climate change and COVID and stuff. And like there are reviews saying the satire is scattershot or not very pointed. Like, <laughs> what? Like, did you did, did you watch the movie? It's the least <laughs> subtle movie I think I've ever seen. I know. That's not what I've heard from some people. I've mainly just yeah. heard that some pe I've heard some people say that the movie's a little too uh, cynical for their tastes. Mm. Um, I guess it's kind of cynical. I, like, as a person who's who's borderline allergic to cyni- to cynicism at, at, at this point in my life, anyway, I didn't find it that cynical. It was certainly cynical to an extent, but like, I think it did a good job of displaying the worst of humanity and the best of humanity. Yeah, I don't yeah. Agree. No, I just read uh, one review from somebody I know where he said uh, something like, "quote I think he said, and I quote, somebody needed to rot and bury this, scre- this script up." Oh, okay. I mean, not everything needs to be super optimistic and everything, but yeah. Um, which is which is one of the points they make in the movie, uh, but overall, I I thought it was so much fun. It was it was it was funny. It was pointed. It kind of made me feel like uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not like not like vindicated, but like like seen, I guess. Yeah. Because okay. like I'm like, is no one going to talk about how fucking absurd the situation we're in is? Like this is this is insane. And the movie is just like, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't look up. Yeah, <laughs> that that entire that entire well the entire bit at the end there. I do want to say I think the movie was a little too long. Um, it did it did drag a little bit, especially towards the end, mm-hmm. and uh, some of the editing is just baffling. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I was thinking that too when I was watching it. Like some of the cuts they choose and it, it's just like really jarring. Yeah, and there's that bit yeah. at the end there where they're all sitting around the table and they just like do freeze frames. And the conversation keeps going. And yeah, it's just like a freeze frame of somebody. Uh, yeah, I, I I thought my internet was lagging, but then me too. But like I, I rewinded it, rewind and kept watching it, and I was like, oh, that's it. That's, that's part, a choice they made. Is, okay, is, Adam McKay, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, um, this is weird. Yeah, I think a lot of the performances are really good. I think there's definitely some bits, especially at the end, the very end. Um, spoilers here, by the way. I'm not gonna. I'm really not gonna be transparent with this at all. Spoilers. Um, they. The pl- so the planet does get destroyed. It gets hit by that by that by the comet and it's annihilated. Mm-hmm. A lot of people manage to leave Earth, um, and they go to another planet. That part was just too fucking dumb for me. <laughs> like, yeah, I didn't really like that part either, especially like with um how the billionaire played by or the uh, the billionaire played by Mark Rylance, who's who's a great character. By Unbelievable, the way. he's so <laughs> Mark Rylance's performance is so fun. Um, but, uh, he had made a prediction earlier. He has like an algorithm that can predict people's deaths or whatever. And then, um, he, the president asks what, how she'll die. And, uh, he's like, oh, you're going to get killed by a Bronto rock. I'm like, yeah, we don't know what it means. <laughs> yeah. And then she, and then she does get killed by an alien called a Bron- that they call a Bronto rock. And I, I, I didn't like that because that moment where he tells her is right before everything goes wrong with the billionaire's plan. So I was like, oh, that's, that's like a, that's like a hint saying this billionaire doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Yeah. And it's like it's a lot dumber than he's playing off, and then it actually it happened, it does pay which off, I, yeah. which I didn't really like. But uh, overall, I enjoyed the movie immensely. Yeah, me too. I agree. I think it uh, it's definitely more charming than I think it had any right to be. Um, especially mm-hmm. like, uh, although some of the character decisions and choices and stuff aren't specifically charming, like Leo's entire little yeah. arc there. But then he's mm-hmm. he's redeemed, you know, which is really nice. I I don't normally like Jennifer Lawrence, and I thought she was. Very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, very oh, no, she good. was great. Yeah, and then Jonah. Well, Hill I mean, you don't like you don't really like Jennifer Lawrence now. Back like seven years ago, oh, right. you were gonna marry that woman. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, no, I liked it too. I liked it fine. Um, is there anything else on your list, Lucas? Uh, no, that's it. Cool. Well, then I'll take over. Um, I also watched Freaky with uh, Vince Vaughn and Catherine Newton. Um, also fine. <laughs> like, it's really nothing <laughs> special and nothing really happens at -hmm. all basically vince vaughn is a 15 year old girl for most of the movie and he's hilarious oh right i'm 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 remembering seeing seeing trailers for it now yeah Yeah. watched it around this time last year um yeah freaky friday the 13th yeah um and yeah it's it's entertaining some of the kills are pretty fucking violent and i was like that this is exactly what i want in a horror movie but they don't do enough to really like Mm -hmm motivate the movie itself it could have they could have gotten away with that being like uh uh an episode of some 
anthology series or something like that, and it would have worked a lot better, I think, and just a little shorter. But, yeah, uh, Vince Vaughn is just fantastic. He's really good playing a 15-year-old, but then 15-year-old girl as well, but then also as, like, a very imposing, like, serial killer. When they actually show him as just, like, the killer... It's fu- fucking terrifying. He's act yeah, he's actually pretty intimidating. Like he's a big, tall, lumbering, imposing man. Because he's like six five or something. I don't know. Yeah, he's a big guy. He's a very large man, and he's very intimidating and obviously very strong. And they show it very well in the movie. But I liked it fine. I I mean I probably won't watch it again, but you know, it's okay. I watched uh The King of Staten Island, which came out last year. That's oh, uh, yeah. the one with Pete Davidson, directed by Judd Apatow. Everyone's favorite man slut, Pete Davidson. Yes. And uh, <laughs> it's got Marissa Tomei and Bill Burr. Uh, C. Buscemi's there. You know, it's a, it's Lou Wilson's in that movie. He's in he's in a and d show I watch. <laughs> Who's Lou Wilson? Uh, he's um. Uh, he, he's he's in he's in Dimension Twenty. Uh, he he was like a I think he was Pete Davidson's friend. He's got like dreads. He's a bigger guy. Oh yeah 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 yeah. He's funny. Um, but, uh, yeah, I liked it fine. I do think the message is like a friend of mine. Uh, well, Joel, he was on the show, uh, a long time ago. Uh, but I read his review and basically he, he nailed it on the head. It's like, um, rich white kid, uh, needs to learn or needs to check his privilege and actually doesn't like gain anything. <laughs> like <laughs> there's really nothing gain or er- gained or earned. It's just kind of like a nice story about family, you know? Um, and Bill Burr is just fantastic, which is oh. like he's he does a dramatic role like fairly fairly well. Um, nice. And also, just Marissa Tomei is such a gem, and she wears these big fucking glasses the whole time. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, I also watched a movie, a documentary um, called Woodstock '99: Peace, Love, and Rage, and it's uh, it covers Woodstock 1999 uh, and the disaster that was that festival. Um, how they really start to go like go into the mismanagement of the festival, um, how a lot of people are pointing fingers at each other and whatnot, um, how Fred Durst is a total piece of shit, uh, um, how there was a lot of sexual assault that happened during that 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 weekend as well, um, that ended up promoting or uh, creating like a um, like a, a non profit foundation. That's how many sexual assaults happened. At Woodstock '99, that they Jesus. needed to make a like non for profit organization to help and find these these women, which is just a, a insane. Um, That's wild. Yeah, but uh, anyway, it was good. I, I like if you like music and you n- want to learn anything about like the disaster that was this weekend, then I do suggest it. And then finally, I started rewatching Dexter, and I used to love that show when I was when I was a kid. Uh, well, when I was younger, I wouldn't say a kid because I was like a teenager when it started airing, but I still do. I still really like that show. I'm on season four now, and uh, it still holds up, I would argue. A lot of it is, obviously, a lot of it is pretty dumb, <laughs> and like, there's no way you would be able to Typical last HBO this long. stuff. Yeah, to, well, Showtime, but yeah. Um, oh, I thought, oh, shit, I thought Dexter was HBO for some reason. No, it's Showtime, uh, but he... There's no way Dexter would be able to last this long as a serial killer. There's no fucking way. He's he's a smart man, but he's also dumb as a rock. Um, <laughs> and some of the writing that they give his sister, um, Deborah, is just abysmal. The, and but Jennifer Carpenter, bless her heart, she she's such a good job at, at performing it. Uh, most of her dialogue is just curse words. Uh, but <laughs> I'm watching it in because I want to watch New Blood which is the series they just wrapped uh, like this last weekend. Uh, and I want to watch that. So I feel like I need to catch up. And when I was younger, I stopped watching around season six. So I need to now plow through four seasons of this show just so I can watch this new one. But anyway, I like it. It's still good. It still holds up. Anyway, Liam. Nice. Uh, I guess, uh, first things first, uh, there are two things I've watched. I've been watching with Christian. First things first, it, or sorry, I guess I'll start with I've started watching or, Over the Garden Wall. Mm-hmm. Nice. And I like it a lot. Um, it de- I think it took a, a while for me to watch it, mainly because right when Over the Garden Wall was coming out, it kind of had like, uh, it had the same thing that had me off put from a lot of other shows, which is 
I thought the models and design and look of the show seemed way too similar to every other show that was go that was coming out at the time. Yeah, for sure. Like at least in a post adventure time world. At least like, and it's look uh, at looking at like Wirt and Greg and stuff. Like if you look at their faces, that's very traditional um, cartoon network of like the like, mm -hmm. aughts or whatever. Yeah, like or like the twenty ten, like the early twenty tens. Like it was something I got tired of really quick. Um, but no, I'm about I think I'm four episodes in now. I think uh -oh. yeah, yeah you yeah, because you you we oh, got so, we we got up to the episode where they're on the boat, right? Uh yes, yeah. I think um the best the best way you can describe the show is, it's very charming. Like it's not like a number of other shows where I think like the humor like uh, can get really patronizing or like really up in your face or just like, kind of like uh quirky for the sake of being quirky. I overall just find the characters and situations to be very charming. Well, also uh, dosed over with a lot of intrigue. Yeah. I think that's mm -hmm. something like there's all, you're always wondering what's really going on or what's going to happen next. I think that's my favorite thing is that I can never predict where it's going to go. Um, all of the voice acting is great. Um, it does have like the very simplistic character models, at least for their leads. But like, like so many other sh great shows like that, they put the focus in the right places when it comes to the animation, like the backgrounds and like uh, the the strange creatures or people they encounter like the pumpkin guy yeah like yeah. they really put yeah they really put their work into there yeah. um but no overall i'm really enjoying it um i've also uh just because uh after fucking spider-man no way home i uh wanted to go see an actual good thing watch a good thing with his character again so i've been re-watching daredevil with christian yep partially also because he's never seen it yep um yeah, still really fucking great. In fact, it's great. I really hope I don't eat my words on this by the time we get to the end of the first season. But I still stand by that I think the first season of Daredevil, again, at least at this point, may be the best piece of superhero media ever put to television or film. Okay, mm. sure. Yeah, yeah, like it's very well written. All the performances are excellent. Like, um, there, even just on this rewatch, for a number of things I'm no I forgot about that. Like, particularly with the way Charlie Cox portrays Matt Murdock, which is, like, there's a big emphasis on when, like, he's uh, performing. Since he's blind, he's always watching your mouth, uh, other people's mouth when talking to them and never their eyes. Yeah. Oh, okay. And that's a really cool... Subtle. Uh, that's a... Yeah, it's a really nice little detail. Um, and just, like, uh, the way it breaks down his... Uh, it really perfectly adapts, like, what I've always found fascinating about Daredevil... Like, working with the limitations of a character, like how he can get hurt and beaten up. Like, he gets hurt a lot on that show. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, it always has the thing where he gets back up, even though how bloody or beaten he's been. Um, and it also just perfectly explores the psychology and how, and the walking contradiction of Matt Murdock and, and Daredevil. No, again, on this rewatch, I'm happy that I'm not that uh it's aged as well as it has and I haven't eaten my words yeah we're watching it pretty slowly that's why I didn't really bring it up in the ingestion but um we're only on episode three or we're going on to episode four right yeah we're just about to start episode four we were just yeah. introduced to finally introduced to uh Kingpin yeah and there's 10 episodes a season right uh yes yeah yeah so we'll um, uh we'll probably hammer through that and have something for you in the next episode probably but um yeah. Uh, another, uh, just a quick couple of things. Um, I finished, uh, Hawkeye. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess it does make sense to move on to that since, uh, yeah, spoiler alert, Fisk is on Hawkeye. Yep. Um, overall, it was a relatively satisfying finale. Um, it definitely is a big, dumb climax, but it's never, but what I appre did appreciate it is that it didn't get too overblown. Like, uh, there's this really, like, even just with Final Battle or whatnot, it's really just uh, Clint and Kate Bishop, like, shooting off a bunch of arrows and fighting guys on a big skating rink outside a building. <laughs> it's very fun. It is very yeah. fun. Nice. It's kind of, it kind of has that diehard tone, like, uh, like, running through, just trying desperately to survive and avoid, like, getting hurt as much as possible. Im imminent death, yeah. Um, there are a few things that did have me a little confused, like... I guess because it's officially in the MCU, MCU now, uh, uh, Kingpin is now superhuman. I really don't get why. Like, he gets shot, in, like, twice in the chest with arrows. An explosion goes off right in front of him. Uh, he gets hit by a car at one point. It's yeah. it's pretty <laughs> ridiculous. 
Yeah. Um, Which is not like I, to my knowledge, in the Daredevil show, he's not meta human or anything. Like he's just he's a, just really he's, just a, he's big, just a big, really strong, strong dude. man. <laughs> yeah, but in this one, yeah, like Liam said, he gets shot in the chest like three times with arrows, <laughs> and that doesn't take him down. I don't know. Wow. Um, and uh, and this is just an aside, but he had a he had a really fucking dumb wardrobe in this in this show. Yeah, he he looked like he just got back from Miami. <laughs> yeah. oh no apparently it's a reference to some comic book i've never read but i was like okay why are you putting it in here from what i understand it's completely irrelevant to what you're adapting what book was it it's some spider-man issue with <laughs> fucking <laughs> Ugh. okay yeah um <laughs> but fucking no, uh, marvel overall i think that this is the most consistent of a plus shows i think it's definitely the most enjoyable uh there are points where it has the same problem all the shows have, where I think it bit on a little more than it could chew, and by the end, I don't know if it all came together. Yeah. Like, there are a few plot elements that kind of get railroaded in, or, like, uh, they kind of lose sight of. But overall, I was just genuinely happy that uh, Hawkeye really finally got his chance to shine in a Marvel thing. Yeah, I agree. Like, uh, and I still stand by when Jeremy Renner acts, he really fucking acts. Even if he's just doing, uh, even if he's just doing a performance like Hawkeye, where... It would be easy for him just to phone it in. He's really good. Even uh, Haley Steinfeld, who's been pretty hit or miss for me in recent years, uh, there are time she walks that fine line between getting really annoying. Um, but like, I think what works is that like when she kind of does the whole annoying, quirky youth Tom Holland thing, you kind of have a dry, you kind of have Renner's dryness to punch her back with. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, it's no, weird how they got a gorilla I... to act though. That's very <laughs> odd. <laughs> That's a that's a joke yeah. that's a joke for our patrons. It's, just, it's a very specific joke. Yeah, no, I again I enjoyed it overall. I think uh, like it's not great by any means. I gave I think on my letterbox I gave it like a three point five out of five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which like I don't know. Overall, I enjoyed it. And then uh, the last thing I watched just because this is where I'm gonna rant for a second. Oh, I God. haven't been able to go to the fucking movies lately, despite how much I really want to go see uh, Nightmare Alley and Licorice Pizza. But apparently, things can't be reasonable for one fucking second in our province without the piss ant shitting the bed again. Yep. But, so I was stuck at home and I bit the bullet and watched the first episode of Boba Fett. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. And? Eh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of what I expected. It yeah. definitely has, um, it has pilotitis. Mm. Where like, it's kind of oh, structured really weird, and it's, and it's yeah. just mainly <laughs> that's, about is that setting... similar? Is that similar to Ligma? <laughs> I heard Steve Jobs died of Ligma. <laughs> Sorry, <God damn> <laughs> carry on. <laughs> Who the fuck yeah, is Steve Jobs? <laughs> um, no, it was uh, it was fine. Uh, there are parts of it which were kind of cool. Like uh, I bet the biggest positive I will get give it is that I think Robert Rodriguez is the only director on these Star Wars shows who knows how to shoot with that with that uh, green screen technology and not make it look like a fucking holodeck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there are points where, like, there's characters having a fight scene on, like, a roof on Tatooine, and, like, uh, we're kind of scaling it around, and I could actually make out depth in the background. It doesn't look like... It does. It isn't, doesn't look like an obvious illusion. Uh, so that was a plus. Um, it's also... Uh, uh, what was it? I don't know if it's a directing thing, like, just because I was only briefly impressed with him in Mandalorian, but uh, Tamoira Morrison's really into the role. Like, it's really cool to actually see him physically commit himself to it. Um, but he's not a young guy. Yeah, he's old mm. now. Um, I think the biggest thing, problem with it also is just, it's the same problem I have with uh, The Mandalorian, where it's just a reference show. Like, it's like, hey, guys, remember Tashi Station? Yeah, we're actually going to go to there. They actually go to Tashi Station. Yeah, Luke never yeah. actually went. Do you see yeah, power I'm converters? Like... <laughs> I was just like, yeah, I really wanted to see that, guys. Like, yeah, that was really an itch that's, that I really needed scratched for 40 years. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, no one actually cares about seeing it. It's just a meme. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, No, it's... uh, I don't know. There's, as far as pilots go, there's enough intrigue. Like, it kind of... Parts of it did kind of remind me of Riddick a little bit. Um, but overall, it's just uh, another thing that uh, annoying fanboys are going to shoot me for saying, but which is by the time I was it was over, I thought to myself, 
Why should I care? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to. I don't feel like I'm going to watch it. And if I do, it's probably, probably going to be like inebriated of some and some way just to get I through think, it. I think it's also that I don't really care about. I've never understood the whole obsession with Boba Fett. Because he looks maybe cool. Legend, That's the thing. He's, maybe, he looks yeah. cool. But like just because somebody looks cool doesn't mean you want to know everything about them, right? Some of the books and the Legends canon were kind of interesting when I was reading them growing up. But as far as the movies go, I'm like, why did he didn't do anything? Yeah, he's cool armor. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And like he just he's stood cool around. Yeah, he's got a cool yeah, and cartoon. Then, <laughs> and then got fucking pushed into the Sarlacc like a bitch. What <laughs> Boba Fett where? <laughs> Boba Fett! Boba Fett where? And Han turns around with a stick and hits Boba Fett into the Sarlacc. <laughs> I just like I used to get thrown in like a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Not even was, thrown in, pushed in. Pushed in like oh, a little there, bitch. <laughs> there is one other thing I was gonna that we do see that I will bring up, which is and I know a lot of fanboys were really were really spraying their pants seeing this, but I had the same problem that I had see with uh seeing uh uh Kirk uh, how Kirk beat Kobayashi Maru and Abram Star Trek and seeing Han do the Kessel run in solo which is that it's more interesting to hear about and imagine for yourself than it is to actually see. And what's that? Uh, That's Boba Fett escaping the Sarlacc pit. Right, 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 right. Oh, okay. Like, they actually show how he did it and how he got out. I thought they, just, again, show, like, I thought they just show his, his glove coming out of the sand. No, he. Uh, you see him inside the thing. Oh, wow. I don't and think we, like, ever, we ever needed to see what was inside of a Sarlacc pit. That's, that's... I don't know. I was just like... This was a lot cooler in my imagination. Yeah, I agree. Is it just like a huge graboid? Pretty much. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> anyway. Oh, man. Uh, anything else, Liam? Uh, no, that covers it all. All right. Again, I would really like to go to the movies, but uh, for some reason, we just keep letting this bullshit happen. Yep. I mean, <laughs> also, COVID's just going to be a thing that we got to live with for essentially the rest of our yeah, lives. Yeah, but so. some people could be doing a far better job than they are. That is true. I'm not disagreeing with you, Liam. I also <laughs> want to go to the fucking movies. But I'm just, anyway, I'm not defending COVID or Jason Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> Devil's advocate for COVID over here. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think COVID's a good thing. <laughs> Have you ever tested your immune system? This is a good... <laughs> how can how can Eating you? Up the weak ones. <laughs> how can you? That's how horrible, how are we ever gonna know if respirators work if we don't have something to try it on, right? <laughs> anyway, um, real oh, quick, man. let's talk. Let's just cover um, maybe some of our favorite movies from the past year because it, it's sure. January now, and so 2021. I didn't see it as much as I definitely thought and wanted to and hoped to. Yeah. I watched a lot of stuff that was older obviously mm -hmm. um because locked up at home but my list is very short um but some of the most notable things on here are Godzilla versus Kong cuz that movie was a riot um it's very stupid but it was a it was very fun uh the suicide squad and i think mm. i speak for everybody on here that that movie was yes I, it dope. wasn't on my list but that was cuz i kind of forgot about it but it's great yeah, it's dope, great. dope as fuck um yeah. <laughs> Uh, old, uh, M. Night Shyamalan's old. And the only reason is because it's the funniest movie I've probably ever seen, and I don't oh, think that was intentional. And you know what? And I will always at least respect the fact that in as saturated a climate as we have, as a film climate we have, we actually did get a completely creative-driven movie. Yeah. And even if it failed, I still respect that it existed. My name is Jaren. Uh, <laughs> I'm a nurse. <laughs> I haven't did even you, seen it because I've made that such a running did, joke. Did you know? Uh, did Did you know Marlon Brando and Jack Nicholson were in a movie together? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Does anyone know the name of that feature? That's a oh, real movie. Man. Um, and then, I uh, a more obvious one as well is The Green Knight. We did an mm -hmm. entire episode mm -hmm. on it. That's that's on my that's on mine as well. I figured as much. Yeah, it's that was probably the best movie I saw last year, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of just production and actually getting to go go to the movie theaters and then finally my favorite movie of 2021 was bo burnham's inside and i <laughs> <laughs> there is True. no no doubt True. in my mind um all right go ahead boys uh well i only picked three and you covered most of them oh yeah look at me go. Same. <laughs> <laughs> look at me go um the big the big three that really stuck out to me um 
where um the Suicide Squad, um even to a point where uh, it was on my Christmas list this year, mm -hmm. and I, I think because it was actually again, uh it showed that we can actually make in a completely oversaturated bland superhero movie climate we can actually if you put the focus in the right places and let creative people actually do some do what they want to do we you can get a pretty kick-ass movie out of it yeah <laughs> easily the best comic book movie i saw this year I agree. oh yeah um then uh next up would be the green knight um i can't be more happy than a movie like that got actually got greenlit and released mm. um Easily one of the best shot movies I saw this year or production designs. Um, I loved how uh, how faithful it was to um, the, to the Arthurian legend, but also kind of being an avant-garde, postmodern deconstruction of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in a number of ways, it kind of filled that void. Um, uh, was it? it kind of gave me the same feels Blade Runner 2049 gave me, but for different reasons. Like, just... it. In fact, like, the way it was kind of directed and put together, it reminded me of Blade Runner 2049, but medieval fantasy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I approve so, that message. Um, and then lastly, Dune. Oh, yeah. That's fair. Um, mm -hmm. Again, like, uh, again, the impossible. An act of a creative-driven blockbuster on such a huge scale. Like, in the way it was done with an abundant, with every, with an abundant, like Lord of the Rings before it, an abundance of almost all perfectly cast actors, um, a clear reverence and love for the source material, um, and just a, and just the scope and ambition alone is, uh, was it is enough for it to, uh, was it was enough for it to make it onto my list. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And also, I'm happy that a lot of Dune fans have finally gotten their due, like waiting for one of these to get, waiting for a proper adaptation to get made. As somebody who has not yet read the books, um, it made me want to read them even more and uh, completely captivated me watching it. Yeah. Again, right if on. I had to pick three <laughs> favorite movies, those would probably be, those are for three favorites of a year. Those are what I would go for. Liam's so well-spoken. I was just like, I like, I like Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> well, all, all, all the movies on my list have been mentioned. So <laughs> <laughs> what, what was your I list? Was, uh, well, originally, originally, I I didn't really see many movies this year, uh, because for obvious reasons. But um, originally, my list was uh, Green Knight and Dune. But then he all reminded me about the Suicide Squad, so yeah. the Suicide Squad's on there as well. And I think you guys said basically everything that I like about those movies. So right. there we go. <laughs> there we go. Small, very small favorites of the year um, review here, everybody. We usually do yeah, a full they're... episode, but there's not much yeah. to fucking. <laughs> There are movies I would have loved to have seen before doing this, but like again, as I mentioned before, I would love to. I would have loved the chance, a chance to have gone to see Nightmare Alley or Licorice Pizza. Yeah, hell, I'd even settle for the Matrix Resurrections at this point. I also, I mean, I should probably add Clifford the Big Red Dog to my list too, because that's the only other movie I fucking saw in movie theaters. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I don't know. You saw a movie where I see you change your letterbox, your letterbox review constantly. For last night in Soho, yeah, yeah. I keep I keep moving and I'm like, do I like this movie? And then I'd like bump it up to like a three, and I'll be like, no, I don't. And I put it down to a two, and then I'm like, mm. or wait, no, I really liked that about it. Two and I'll a half. Back up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but I recently changed it again. It's at two now, and I think it's gonna stay at two. So. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but yeah, anyway, that uh, that was the ingestion for this week. We are mm -hmm. gonna go for a quick break, and we will be back with a conversation about our creative process. So we'll see you soon. I think he got it from the name of the song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey everybody, have you seen my balls? They're big and salty and brown. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh man. All right, welcome back to the Thundercast. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about our own personal creative processes. Uh, yeah. And just like kind of what motivates us in being creators ourselves. Um, that's pretty much the setup. <laughs> yeah. Really, there's really not a whole lot to really dive in on on the setup. <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't know how we want to start this conversation, really, because we didn't. Yeah, who wants to start? Who wants to go first? We didn't really rehearse. I, uh, 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 we, we usually we usually rehearse all the episodes, just like yeah. from beginning to end before we actually do them. They're scripted. Like Liam's gonna yeah. raise his hand right now. See. <laughs> 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 I volunteer Christian because he came up with the topic. And Liam's going to sigh 
and say shake my head and <laughs> don't you mean shaking my head shake my head he's uh, going off book i'm so confused what do i do <laughs> <laughs> what is this fucking improv at the at the night owl or something <laughs> anyway um yeah so like i guess personally in terms of just like my creative process um i think what we should talk about first is just like conception of ideas um mm -hmm. when we were in film school my conception of ideas was much more ripe and uh constant and part of that was just because you're surrounded by creative people all the time and or some some creative people all the time and it helps promote your own creativity right so i think being there was a really positive thing for me because it allowed me the opportunity to to get some ideas that i've been thinking of or you know it, not even ideas just like bits and pieces and turn them into something it was a really great time um but nowadays my my conception of ideas is just kind of honestly it will 95 percent of the time will fucking come out of nowhere right which oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. which is the best because you know like here i'll I'll, sh I'll show you for example i have a note on my phone right as most people do um for just like random knickknacks or anything but i have one that's just for movie ideas right so it's a very long very oh, very very long a lot of these are old but someone is, someone is screenshotting and stealing your shit right now <laughs> good luck <laughs> but <laughs> the thing is is sometimes these ideas will come to me and then i will only write one word <laughs> and i'm and i'll look back at them later i'm like what the fuck does that even mean <laughs> like for example moon pirates that's that's all it says. That, that, that's sick. I love it. <laughs> Moon pirates. Three idiot meatballs. What the fuck does that mean? Um, uh, where's another one? Let's see. Uh, the Alanis Morissette Karate Hour. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Interviews for school shooters. Like, what the fuck? Smelly nipples. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> anyway... Yeah, so, some, something that like makes sense in your head at the moment, and you write it down, and you come back to it later, and you're like, "What, <laughs> what the fuck was I talking about? Like, what was I on?" But anyway, like, I think the conception of ideas is, is definitely, obviously, where um, most creative processes begin. Obviously, and so for me, um, when I come up with an idea, I like to obviously like to throw it past people. So I'll tell a couple people like I have an idea for a sketch or a short film, and just kind of gauge the reaction off of what i've said and if i get very little reaction or i get no reaction at all i'm like okay we're not doing that one <laughs> like um but I'll, other times i'll just risk it i'll say fuck it i'm just gonna write this and then we'll see what happens and, I th and that's part of what happened with the short film that's coming out um with um thunder lizard in the next couple months here hopefully it's called was it something i said and that was a sequel to a movie that i had shot uh, a couple of years ago that never actually got actualized, like didn't, didn't get finished or anything. And part of that was because of the pandemic and everything like that. Um, and that movie was called say something. And so I made, was it something I said, or wrote, was it something I said with the intention of directing myself, but we got John Tasker to direct it. So John um, directed I'm it. Sorry, I'm sorry. Who? Oh, John Tasker, friend of the show. Sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah <laughs> yes. That's his real name. <laughs> um, but uh, we got him to direct it and, or he he offered, and so that was that was great. But um, I'm kind of running my my train here. What the fuck am I trying to say? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so so with that, I I just kind of gam I just did the gamble. I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna write this script, even if it does nothing but sit on my hard drive for years. And it did. It did sit on my hard drive for like a year or two. And then we eventually you show it, you show it to people, and they're like, that's actually pretty good. Like I like the writing here. I like this. I like that. What can we change? And the collaborative process is definitely really helpful. But for me, obviously, the idea-making process is obviously the most important part of any creative process. It's also oftentimes the most frustrating thing on the fucking planet <laughs> because you come up with an idea and nobody likes your idea and then you just hate yourself, right? But anyway. I mean, I never have understood the hate yourself thing. Like, well, well. I mean, it, it comes from a lot of, like, creative people um... – tend to uh, uh like tie their value to their creativity so if they feel like their creativity isn't good enough they feel like they're not good enough it's not like i have personal experience with this or anything <laughs> yeah i feel personally attacked right now 
<laughs> and creatively attacked. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's it's an interesting phenomenon because like a carpenter when he builds a chair and his chair is shit, he's not like oh I'm shit. Just he's just like my chair is shit. <laughs> right. But like if if you if you write a story or like make a piece of music or something, and then you, you think it's shit, you're just like oh I must be shit. Yeah. Which is is I I don't, I don't know if it's it's pretty common among creative people, which is uh, annoying. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Liam, how do you come up with ideas? Uh, well, that's the thing is that there's not really ever just a one answer. Usually, what the way I come up with an idea is, well, one, I have a series of games that I play to try and just keep my brain going. One's where, called What's uh, one, in My Mouth. No, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Continue. I let you talk. <laughs> that was scripted. Um. <laughs> uh, on, one of my favorite things to get my mind going is I'll ask. Uh, Sometimes I'll just ask a dumb what if question and see if like I get an amusing answer or mm -hmm. like uh, that usually kind of gets things going. Sometimes it'll be um, again just hanging out with some friends and chatting. Like um, uh, there will also be like uh, again it kind of just comes at random places. Like even sometimes if I'm just reading the news, yeah, or like I have a really strong opinion on something. Like uh, actually that one tends to come up a lot as I am a pit pretty politically driven man i uh, was a, a person a avid what? news reader no <laughs> um uh again or just even like uh uh but yeah for when it come when it comes down to coming up with ideas that's usually how it goes i think it also helps that i have a job that at times allows me to uh really thrive and uh Keep that going for ideas. Yeah. The problem I more so run into is actually writing them down or acting on them when I have them. Mainly just because uh, I struggle to write without a partner. Like, I need, I have trouble processing ideas if I don't have something to bounce off with. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I I definitely have had that, too. Like, Lucas and I have done some writing together. Liam and I have done some writing <laughs> together. That's part of why this show exists. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for personally, I can write on my own, you know? And when I'm when I start writing things on my own, um, you I can tell if it's gonna go anywhere. Pretty much like right off the bat. Another thing that's probably gonna be infuriating for some screenwriters, if there's anybody watching, is that I'll I'll hammer out like in one night. Like for example, I started writing something last night and I hammered out seven pages, right? And I was like, oh boy, now guess what? I'm not gonna touch that script for three months. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> which is infuriating for screenwriters because a lot of them will write one or two pages a day right but that's not my, how my brain works my brain doesn't function on that that human you know, level i you think know? the problem i run into with that is like i'll get onto a roll and i'll start writing but the issue is that um i start to get really anxious or like really uh just like uneasy because i feel like i've spent at that point i've spent too much time in my own head mm. and i kind of need to which, uh, from my own past experiences, I've realized is a very can be a very dangerous thing for me specifically. Yeah. So like, uh, and then I kind of just like get out for a little bit, and then I kind of forget about it or lose track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no, that's just a, a general hurdle I've always struggled to get over. Mm -hmm. For me, the way I come up with ideas is I completely and utterly embrace the idea that. Um, originality is a sham and I can just steal shit from other people. And then I just, I just take a bunch of different things from a bunch of different places, put them all on a blender, blend them up and hope it comes out good. Yeah. And a lot of times I, it has. That actually, yeah. <laughs> that's actually something that I do agree with Lucas. If there's one thing that really pisses me off when I'm talking with people and sharing ideas is we're like, Oh, it's just like that. Oh, like that thing. Just like kind of in a passing judgmental way. Mm -hmm. Like uh, with a couple of ideas I've had, I'm like, Oh, sure, but mm -hmm. what is originality? Yeah, like, uh, as anyone who's listened to Thunder and Dragons can probably tell, uh, each, uh, sorry, basically... What, what's, what's, what's Thunder and Dragons? Thunder and Dragons is a D&D &D show, uh, where I, I, I run, uh, Christian and Liam and our friend Dan through Godhood. It's a, it's a show that you can Christian. listen to. Episodes occasionally come out. Christian, um, we only uh, have four patrons. They know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, Ouch. Each 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 arc each arc of um 
uh, Thunder and Dragons is is largely based on other properties. Some sometimes the inspiration is more obvious than others, like the Planet um, of the Apes one. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the current one I'm seeing a lot of uh, Annihilation or Princess mm-hmm. Mononoke influences. Mm. I, I I did not I did not consciously include Princess Mononoke, but I can I can kind of see that now. Uh, and I, I did I did watch Princess Mononoke. Uh, I think uh, around the time I was designing that adventure, and this that adventure actually has not. Uh, come out yet that that uh, that arc hasn't uh, aired but oh, yeah, I guess um, it hasn't. yeah uh but and like one of the other game D D games that i run uh is is uh it takes place in this city uh that's in the middle of the tu- middle of like this endless tundra uh it's extremely difficult to, to survive and it's it's ruled by this like authoritarian uh uh, the- uh theocratic monarchy sort of uh government and uh, the players are all sort of like uh uh people trying to fight against the uh it's like a kind of like a revolution story sort of thing and obviously part of that part of that inspiration is obviously like star wars right uh to a large extent and also uh a, a huge inspiration for it was also castlevania especially the first season because there, there a lot of it is like urban fantasy in this big uh like city with like these oppressive religious figures and like i was like what if that combined with star wars but in the snow <laughs> so, so, and that's uh, kind of how that setting uh came to be right on yeah i think moving on in terms of just like the creative process i suppose is uh execution i think that's a huge part mm-hmm. of of obviously the creative process um i i think like i was mentioning earlier when it comes to like screenwriting or when it comes to like even writing because i'm writing on i'm working on a number of things all the time um I know that is also probably something that would be infuriating for someone to hear is like, I'm working on this screenplay and I'm working on this and I'm working on this and I'm working on this. Um, Like, why don't you just focus on one? And again, because my brain does not function like that. (laughs) Like I physically (laughs) cannot do that. I I don't have the, the attention to, am I outing myself? (laughs) (laughs) Outing self-diagnosing myself on the show. Um, But uh, yeah, when it comes to like <clears throat> physical execution or something, that it can it can be such a monster, right? And self motivating is obviously a huge part of that. Um, so, how do you guys motivate yourselves to to engage and create? Uh, mostly, I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mostly, what what I need is is like an is like an external like deadline or something like that. Otherwise, it just isn't going to happen. Yeah. I, I, I try to self motivate, and it like sometimes I sometimes I do just sit down and work on something for like hours at a time, and then I'm like, oh shit, time has passed. Uh, but like other times, like for that's one of the reasons I'm I I I, I really love uh, preparing for D and D is like I set like we set a time, me and the players like set a time that we're gonna play, and I have to be ready for that. Otherwise, right. I'm gonna show up and be like, hey guys, we're not playing D and D. Sorry. Uh, which is uh, disappointing for everyone involved. So that's that's something that motivates me. Is I I kind of need an external factor uh, to actually keep me going. Okay. Well, we need the next episode of Thunder and Dragons by next week. Uh- okay. <laughs> 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 that, that that is one of the reasons why ep- episodes come out occasionally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How about you, Liam? I, uh, I don't really have an answer. I've thought about like giving myself a hard deadline might help. But again, I feel like sometimes it needs to be implemented by like, this is what you need to have this by then. Like, I think Lucas's approach might work. Just, I don't know. These days, I find it really hard to get myself motivated on that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, that's part of why we started the collective to begin with, right? Was to motivate one another and to kind of put deadlines in place so that we would be um, responsible for our creative actions right and like thunder lizard has always kind of been one of those things where like we don't really have a dedicated like member base or anything like that like it's mostly it's it's us it's us three right ultimately with some people who drop in every once in a while like like john tasker friend of the show like ezra right like we have these people that want to come in and help us and stuff and but i think us in our in our movement away from podcasting and going into a little bit more of the YouTube space, we're we're gonna be forced to be 
personally responsible for these these things, right? Because well, personally responsible, but also collectively responsible in that. Yeah, like, like accountable to each other. Yeah, sort of accountable to one another, right? So we know that like the first episode of this is going to need to come out on this day. And if we don't, if we're missing deadlines all the time, then we'll, then are we really motivated to create, right? Mm-hmm. And missing deadlines and stuff is kind of like a um, accountability between all of us, like it, like it, whatever. But I understand what you're saying is like holding yourself accountable can be quite difficult when you're working on things that are personally creative, right? Like yeah, like well, I was saying with with uh, with writing like the book that I was writing or write am writing or the screenplays and stuff is that I don't have a deadline. I've told people like, oh, it'll hopefully be out by spring. Spring is in like two months. You think I'm gonna write a fucking book in two months, Christian? No, you idiot. <laughs> like, my whole my whole thing is mainly like uh it's not on oh it's not only like the self motivation thing, there's also just even points where if I have a time or energy because I have two jobs as well as other commitments I need to worry about. Yeah. And there are points where like there are sometimes even times where I'm almost too tired to even record the show. But you do it anyway and I love yeah, you. And for it, it require and that requires very little work from me. <laughs> 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 i don't know i find that so funny just, yeah i just kind of show up just like, yeah. christian does all the work <laughs> christian edits the show christian puts it up on patreon christian does it right. um but yeah i mean i like doing the show so and i like doing the stuff with thunder lizard so i think i think that's a huge part of it is liking what you're doing right mm-hmm. if you don't like what you're doing anymore then why the fuck are you doing it like mm-hmm. what, what kind of masochist are you I think the other problem I have is, like, again, just confidence and ideas or just, like, being able to ground where my own thoughts are going and process them. I do have methods I have, I do use for trying to ground them, like, whether it be through drawing or um, here's something I'm actually kind of uh, nerdy that I'm going to reveal about myself on the internet. Uh, may God have mercy for my soul. <laughs> uh, um, uh, was it is when I have writer's block, uh, what is it? Uh, or I'm just having trouble figuring out where to go. I pull out my old toys and play with them. Yeah. There you go. I literally pull a f- pull some figures because uh, I collect uh, toys and figures. I'll pull them off the shelf and just move them around and play with them. You know, one of my absolute favorite things in the whole world. Um, we talked about this because we did a we did a, a Thunder Lizard Jamboree, which is like our our staff meetings basically a little while ago. Is is Lego is the most fucking beautiful thing on the planet and it's because it gets it helps you shut off while also still actively participating in something. And I see what you're saying, Liam, is like, you know, having something kinetic to motivate your thoughts. It can be one of the most positive things, right? And and imaginative play is something that should be maintained into your adulthood. It should not just oh, be something that you lose when you're a child. And if anybody makes fun of you for liking Lego or playing with toys or anything like that, then that person is a soulless lost human being, in my opinion, because like what mm-hmm. you lost your innocence at one point. And that's something that are not even innocence, just like your ability to think your playfulness. Uh, your, yeah. Your playfulness. Right. And I mean, yeah, sometimes people's playfulness translates to human beings and that's fucked up and you're an idiot and you're an asshole. Um, cause you're playing with people's lives rather than playing with, you know, um uh, imaginary lives <laughs> yeah exactly like i want to play with krang and uh mm-hmm. the, the turtles right and that might, yeah that might motivate you and help you anyway sorry I was rambling. yeah i think i think my version of that is 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 D because like d when, when you think about it D is pretty stupid <laughs> yeah <laughs> like like i especially when you're like running D D, you're just you're making sounds and talking at like your friends in like a bunch of different voices and like as as like villains and friends and just all these different people and and like you can somehow get people emotionally invested when you threaten to kill an imaginary person that you made up in the moment <laughs> I, know, like, right? <laughs> I saw this meme this is unrelated this is a sidebar but it was uh D D player obviously wants to fuck his character <laughs> <laughs> sorry i just thought of that it was very funny Anyway, um, yeah, no, that's something that happens, definitely. Yeah, like I wouldn't want to fuck Rogmar. That man, that would be scary. That would hurt. He's too big. <laughs> Look at this guy. I don't know if you can see him back there. Look at him. He's fucking huge. <laughs> yeah, so much bigger than the other two in the picture. Yeah. Anyway, uh, sorry, I interrupted you. No, I was, I was kind of done. That was, that was basically it. Just like D and D requires you to, if if you're if you're afraid of looking silly, 
you cannot play D and D. It's just it's just not a thing you can do. Yeah, no, like you right. have to you have to look silly or or sound silly to to play D and D. It's just kind of a prerequisite. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And and I it took a long time for me to get into Dungeons and Dragons. It wasn't until we were in school together, Lucas, that I was like mm-hmm. even contemplating it. And and like yeah, yeah. Well, the, the the first time we played was the first time I played. I had wanted to play for a very long time, but I could never find people to play with. Uh, and, and like that, the time we played kind of broke the seal for me and I'm like, okay, this is something I'm, 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 I'm diving into. Yeah. The only <laughs> and only person hard. I knew, I knew growing up that knew how to play lived out in BC. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's that, I mean, even better with DMD is that there are so many ways to play it, right? Like there's, yeah, mm-hmm. there's the rule book and there's ways that or you know, a, a guide the handbook, sorry. That kind of guides you how to play, but it doesn't. Well, there's, there's the player's handbook and there's the dungeon master's guide, so you're writing both both accounts. Nice, go me. <laughs> um, but it's there's no hard set rules. Like rule number one of D and D is do whatever the D, the DM says or yeah. <laughs> what the DM says goes. But a, a good DM will uh, like uh, like um what's the word I'm looking for? Will like play to his players or their players, right? But like uh. I, I play with DMs who are very, who 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 like, they want to write a novel, but they don't want, but they don't actually want to put in the work to write a novel. So they run a D and D game, and they sort of like railroad everything into like where they want their story to go. Yeah, and and like a linear story in D and D is fine. I've I've played many campaigns with linear stories. A lot of my campaigns are linear stories. That's fine. But if you are like hard railroading your players into like making certain choices. Or like making sure like what you want to happen happens, then that's that's just that's that's not a good way to run the game. The players are not going to have fun. Like like a lot of the the adventures in uh, Thunder and Dragons are pretty linear, yeah. and that's largely because it is like a podcast. It's a, it's a story that like people to follow along with, uh, and that's kind of why I make them more linear. But also, there's lots of shit that you guys do that like I'm like I don't know. Roll die, see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> like kidnapping uh, Kevin Bacon. Start- like, yeah, let's drug let's drug this guy. Yeah, 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 and uh, uh, several things that I don't know if you guys uh, knew were kind of improvised on the spot. Um, spoilers for the beginning of uh, the current uh, airing arc of uh, Thunder and Dragons, but you guys were trying to get into this tower, right? Mm-hmm. And there was a horde of zombies surrounding the tower, and um, you guys searched around and found like a magical back door. Um, that was not prepped. <laughs> oh, really? That was, that was not something that was there. Uh, but like, I think it was Dan who was like, uh, I want to search around and see if there's like another way in. And then he rolled high on his check. And I'm like, okay, you find this magical glyph. And right. I'm like, I don't know what it does. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> so did you want us to just run through the zombies? I, well, I, 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 I don't know. I didn't know. You, I like the, th- what I do is I set up an obstacle and I don't know how you guys are going to solve it. Fair enough. I had a stat block for the horde of zombies in case you wanted to fight it, but right. And then yeah. there's that bit with the, the the puzzle that we beat in 30 seconds. God <laughs> damn it! <laughs> which which you'll hear on the show. This is this is turning into more so a commercial for TND, which I am 100 percent okay with. Um, yeah, sorry, I got carried away with my uh, my uh, creative process and how, and how it relates to D&D. No, that's but, I mean that's that's your most creative out- output, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and like for me, I do a lot of things. Like toot my own horn. I make music. I um, write. I did comics for a while, you know, like do 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 Christian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I I don't know. I I find it very relaxing, but also like there have been so many times where I have like detrimental amounts of anxiety while writing. You know, mm-hmm. like I get this huge pit in my stomach, and I'm just like, holy shit, like. This is this is a reality. Is in like when we did in the trees, for example, and even when we were doing, um, was it something I said? I get intense amounts of anxiety because I'm like, holy shit, this is real. Like people are depending on me right now. Like I'm I'm fucked, <laughs> right? Like I cannot handle other people's lives. I can't handle um, other people's well being and like their creative, you know, decisions and their choices and stuff. Like half the time when we were doing in the trees, I was flying by the seat of my fucking pants. You know, mm-hmm. like I had no idea what the fuck I was doing. And I don't know if that showed probably showed yeah. <laughs> um, shows in the movie. I'll tell you. That. Well, the thing is, the, uh, I definitely uh, have experienced that as well. And I think honestly, I, going back to D&D, I apologize. But like, don't apologize um, That's just... for, for like dungeon being a dungeon master. 
I, I I had to embrace flying by the seat of my pants. Yeah. Because like I would I would plan out I would I would spend hours planning out this adventure and then and then my players would be like, we turn left. I'm like, but I only plan for right. Like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and like the first time one of those things happened, I just had to I just had to I just had to fly by the seat of my pants. I had to improvise. Uh and and I I kind of Dungeon mastering has gotten me used to that feeling. Yeah. And like and, and even to the point where I get I get excited by improvising in D D now. And like, for me, that was super helpful for getting over that sort of feeling. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that's like I, similar experience too. When we were doing in the trees, there was just like, I mean, I think I just going through a breakup or some shit. I don't remember. Um, but uh, just like dealing with that, but dealing with personal shit, but also, um, like, learning from that experience that flying by the seat of your pants is a good thing sometimes <laughs> and and it promotes in uh you know improvise improvisation and whatnot and when we were even doing any movie it's just like okay well how are we going to make this shot work right we did a dolly shot for was it something i said and we nice. used we, well we used a fucking skateboard <laughs> and a tripod <laughs> and a sandbag that was it nice. and it Fair worked enough. and and liam's seen the shot it it's smooth as fuck <laughs> It's nice. like, it should not be as smooth as it was, but that came entirely from um, uh, positive anxiety, I would say, right? Because mm-hmm. it was just like, okay, well, we got to make this work. How are we going to make it work? And and then just like the the forward thinking and the and the, the conceptualization of something, and it made and it functioned, right? It was it was a functional way of, of accomplishing the shot. So, yeah, I think finalizing something is always is always the most difficult part of of a creative process obviously um and for me personally when something is finished it is a big sigh of relief obviously right um but it also is sad <laughs> i find it very mm. sad when i when i finish doing something or finish you know uh, writing something or whatever because i'm like oh well now i'm done with these characters I have a very bad tendency to write sequels to things that don't deserve to have sequels, right? You know, like I started writing a sequel to a movie that's not even out yet, right? So, <laughs> like, I don't know. But does it make you guys sad at all when you finish something? Mm. It's kind of hard to say. Go on, Liam. I get a sigh of relief because I'm like, finally, my brain can be occupied on something else for a little bit, or I can just relax and not have this burden of having all of this, like, that I put my time, money, or even other things that, or everything else into. Yeah. If anything, it just means I get a break, I can refuel, and now I can move, maybe move on to something else. That is, if I have another story or idea in me. Yeah. Are you working right. on it? Are you guys working on anything right now? Uh, uh, just the same old stuff. Yeah. I'm. I'm. Uh, I don't like to tell people what I'm working on because then I, I, my brain's just like, oh, okay, it's done now. <laughs> and I just stop. Yeah. Uh, and. I'm but uh, I, I have several ideas, and I'm always I'm always working on something for D, for some sort of D and D game. Yeah. Uh, even if it never sees the light of day. But uh, as for your question, uh, I don't really get sad when I finish something. I don't. I, I honestly don't really feel anything. <laughs> 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 like a, a lot of people talk about like the dopamine rush that they get when they finish something or accomplish something or whatever. I'm just like, it's done now. Okay. Okay. And that's kind of it. Are you gonna and go maybe, chop maybe up that's, someone, that's what Lucas? <laughs> what was that? So are you gonna go like find a bad guy and chop him up and throw him in the ocean? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, maybe that's why I, I have troubles with motivation because I don't I don't like seem to get the reward uh, at the end of it. But like I uh, I don't know. It's just kind of like oh, it's done now. Yeah. It's, yeah. Some some like if like a long uh, long term D D campaign like recently I. Uh, I was in a I was in a campaign for two years and it recently ended uh, a couple months ago and I was a little bit sad when that ended but I was also excited for whatever we were gonna do next yeah so is that and that group is starting up again and doing something new uh, I'm actually I'm, I'm actually not going to be playing in the the ne- their next campaign because yeah. they uh, he the DM is playing I'm running another campaign and he wants to bring in a bunch more of his friends and uh, I don't I don't do big group D and D right like it, it's just I don't like it. Just too many, too many I, I, cooks in yeah. the kitchen kind of thing. Yeah, and I, I didn't, I didn't want to say, "Hey, don't invite your friends." So, <laughs> so I, I took a step away from the campaign. But yeah. that's just how it is sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think being creative is definitely the best thing that's probably ever happened to me. I would say, um, because I mean, we wouldn't have this show if it wasn't for that, right? I and yeah. I find it hard to believe that there are people out there who say that they're not creative. 
or they're not artistic or anything like that. I think yeah. it's a it's a it's a human just right for one, but also just like uh like it's rooted in your your being, like your your body, your brain. And mm-hmm. you know, I've had people tell me like, "Well, well, I like or you know, people in the um trades or whatever." And they're just like, "Well, I'm not creative." It's like, "Okay, but you problem solve. You do these yeah. things. That that that's that's creativity." Like I I refuse to accept yeah, people it, who it, say, it, "Oh, I'm not, not artistic or I'm not good at art or I don't like drawing and stuff." It's like, "Okay, you don't you don't draw at the caliber that other people do, but you can still mm-hmm. doodle and draw, and that's still oh yeah, for perfect. sure. And like and like like people think when people think creativity, they think like artsy and artistic and stuff like that. When yeah. I think those are those are two different things. I would agree. Like, like you can solve you can solve a problem creatively, but not artistically. Like that's that's something you can do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, but yeah, I I can't I can't separate myself from creativity. Like yeah. like I and I, I can't not be creative. Like if if I if I go a long time without like like at least like thinking about something I find fun or interesting, like and and trying to create something, then like I get very sad. <laughs> yeah, me too. But yep. I've also had moments in my life where I've been absolutely creatively exhausted. You know, after mm-hmm. In the Trees screened at the film festival, the Covalite Film Festival, I came back to Canada because it was in Butte, right? So it was 2018. But I, when I came back to Canada, I remember just like hanging out and being creatively like motivated but exhausted, and that made mm-hmm. me utterly depressed because I was like, "I'm never gonna fucking make anything again." And I remember telling you guys like, "I don't think I'm ever gonna direct again," or "I don't know if I want to write movies anymore," or things like that. And that was just a slump, you know. But that oh, yeah. slump was was really fucking sad <laughs> for me because I was mm-hmm. like, "I don't like." Like I'm no good. I'm no good at anything. Like In the Trees is not particularly like the best movie, um, but it's a okay movie. But it's not the best, you know. And like I thought yeah. it was gonna be better than it was, and this, that, and the other thing. And it sucked for so long to be so sad that you couldn't create, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really glad that I came out of it, but you know, and I don't know if you guys have ever experienced anything like that either. But oh yeah, I'm- like um, for me specifically, uh, the three months where I wasn't on this show. Because mm-hmm. I was uh, elsewhere, uh, those three months fucking sucked. Because I wasn't able to uh, play D anD D. I wasn't able to do this show. I was my life was occupied with other, with other things, and like I was I was very sad. Like I, I hated that three months. It was one of the worst three months of my life. Yeah. And like I was I was so relieved when I was able to come come back and start doing the show again and start playing D anD D again. Because like w- like the the lack of that uh, aspect of my life. So creativity is like is kind of a curse. It's, it's a blessing and a curse because yeah. like it's something that can create so much joy and like uh, a, a sense of accomplishment and stuff like that. But it also can, uh, uh, if it's if it's withdrawn or if you feel bad about your level, your creative skill or whatever, can be one of the greatest sources of pain as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Liam, sorry, you were about to say something as well. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say I battle it constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, like pretty much every other day. Like I often contemplate if it's stuff I actually want to do mainly just cause, um, maybe it's just, maybe this is based on where I live, though. I can imagine it's the same in many other places, which is, I hate the Alberta art scene so much. Um, like, and I just, and I'm also just already just battle being jaded enough about like the way the art scene is and like, uh, the way... Like, the fact how, like, when I do actually meet people who want to be creative or whatnot, all they literally want to do is adapt to their own life stories. Like, they have the most in- amazing, oh, yeah. thoughtful things to say, and I'm like, oh, my God, can we do... S- you know it would be amazing if we did something that wasn't just a coming-of-age story or you just adapting your own Fuck life? You. Fuck you, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> it's just something I've become really... It's just something I've seen a lot, and no, I am not calling you out. <laughs> I know. Let's just say I know some people. Yes, and so, uh, some people I that I'm I'm working with and adapting. Yeah, things. I don't know, and I just find it the whole thing exhausting to a point where I'm like, you know, if I really wanted to know your life, I'd just go read your diary. <laughs> like, um, I think there just... is nothing wrong personally with people being personal in their art. I think when the person when the when 
the art becomes the person, there's a problem there. Yes, which I see way too much of in a, a, what is it in a lot of the circles I'm in, and to, to a point where I want to scrap them. Some people smack them silly and say, "Sorry, I gotta do that thing again." Right back up away from my mic. <laughs> That's literally a delusion of grandeur. That was still very loud. <laughs> that was still very loud. <laughs> yeah. No, and again, it's just the fact that like. I don't know. It's just that I don't. I try to go to creative spaces to try and get away with the fact that I don't think there's nearly enough variety in um, uh, what is it in like particularly Hollywood or the film industry or whatnot, and then like I go to independent or like uh, scenes. I'm like, it's just a stale here, just for different reasons. That's the and whenever some <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, whenever something new is suggested or something like kind of funky it's very rare that like whenever i hear something really weird or interesting get pitched it gets applause or like things people want to do it's usually just uh hey let's uh let me just adapt that time i had lunch at a diner with my friend fuck you fuck you <laughs> you're a dick <laughs> i literally wrote that <laughs> i've written that several times you fucking asshole <laughs> um yeah i mean i, put... I mean Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say I'm I like I I'm I'm really into sci-fi and fantasy. So for like, there's no for me in my opinion at least at least in the uh, books and shows I watch, I I feel like there's no there's not really any there's not really a lack of uh, diversity in in sci-fi and fantasy. Even though from the outside it may look like it, it's all the same. Yeah. Uh, from where I stand, there, there's there's a lot of diversity. Oh, of course. I know, yeah. I'm just getting really tired of people thinking the only way to be interesting and insightful is to just do gen. Uh, was it real world? Uh, uh, was a coming of age stories mm. and it's something i'm seeing a lot of i okay in defense of this i think if you're not writing yourself in some capacity into your art or your work then it's hollow because it's missing that human element I that, am that, aware. that's 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 where things like um spider-man into this or not into the spider-verse like spider-man far from home or no way home sorry uh is lackluster in that because there's very little heart it's 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 a false it's a false heart right it's trying to tell me when i should be emotional rather than being emotionally motivated I'm by not a script saying, right? i am not saying don't put any of yourself into there but when it's all yourself i don't know you are kind of making it sound like that's that's more often than not what people are doing and i don't necessarily agree with that having said that liam Fuck you, <laughs> smirky <laughs> bastard. Um, like, I I oftentimes write stories that are about things that I've experienced. I hyperbolize them, and I fictionalize them, and I make them more, th like, theatrical than what actually happened, you know? Um, but more, like, recently, that's been my, my work, has been personal stories that I feel like people can can relate to having said that I've also written stories about ghosts and goblins and <laughs> fucking Sasquatch you know so like I'm not <laughs> like I, I think I just wish I could see more people taking a was it adapting ex like if you're gonna put your a lot of yourself in there at least try to think more outside the box than what I have been seeing with a lot of people which is literally just making it literally just telling an event that happened in their life where I'm like, uh, you know what? I'd even settle if you had a twist where it's like, what if instead of teenagers having a party, they're werewolves from the future? Okay, it would be Liv. dumb, but <laughs> it would be. I wasn't, but at least it would be interesting. <laughs> but that doesn't, that doesn't add to that specific story. Also, you can't say anything else about that story, okay? You're not allowed because <laughs> that's still in the works. Um, but anyway. Um, so I think we, should, we we we've kind of strayed from process a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because our general thoughts on creativity. You know, um, one but, thing I was gonna say when it comes to like thinking about like getting ideas going or process, one thing I always try to make sure I'm doing is not just a uh, was it if it see, starts to seem too milli too familiar to how I think it would play out, I try to flip it a little bit. Like, uh, maybe if this comes from watching and listening to talks from, like, some of my favorite writers or whatnot. But, like, uh, if there's one thing I always am fascinated with, it's subversion. Yeah. And think and trying to do something that you will never, that you won't expect. That's, when I start to think I'm doing that, that tends to get me, uh, what is it, excited about what I'm doing. 
Yeah, like I mean, Ryan Johnson does it all the time, right? Like flip the box or whatever, or tilt the box. Um, um, uh, Shane Black does it a lot with um, uh, was it with his movies? Yeah, and and I, I I think I understand what you're saying. Like when when you're creating something, and, and it seems derivative, try your best to flip the script and make it. Yeah, flip it, twist it, bop, bop it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Glad we were on the same page on that one. Yeah. Um. Exactly. Yeah, you know. Uh, Mr. Potato Head, <laughs> edge of sketch. Uh, Pull the box inside out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Try, try your best to find ways to to make make it um, creative, but also motivated, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you had a movie about werewolf, teenage werewolf, Nazi zombies from the future who come back and party, that'd be a fucking cool movie. Maybe not the Nazi part. But yeah. <laughs> maybe they're not Nazis. <laughs> I think the other reason why I tend to get really down on just seeing like coming of age stuff in the indie scene is because when I think of like independent things or whatnot that really inspired me, my mind doesn't really tend to go to um go to things like that. I think of things that like tried to do something a little bigger or a little bit more out there, but just worked really well with the budget they had. Something like uh, like as much as I love Napoleon, something like Napoleon Dynamite. I'm more inspired by like things something like Brick. Yeah. Or um the Green Knight, oh, was 15 it? Million. Elm- what? Green Knight, the fifteen fifteen million dollars. Yeah, or that, right? no, I'm talking like super indie. I'm talking like uh I'm more inspired by like El Mariachi than mm-hmm. I am by like um oh was it well I mean I guess clerks is a whole other thing because clerks is something that does genuinely inspire me. <laughs> okay. You, you hypocrite. Fuck you. <laughs> well, but it's also the fact that the reason Clerks inspires me is because it's a generational movie. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so, yeah, where do you guys find inspiration? Liam kind of already um, fulfilled Yeah, that. I kind of already said mine. I, I steal it. I just take it from places I like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, like, uh, what about you? Pretty much the same. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, well, we're, I think we're all thieves. Some of them, yeah. I mean, all the, like, the, 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 there's a reason there's the uh, expression, like, uh, like good artists borrow, great artists steal sort of thing. Yeah. Clearly, we're all great artists. That what we're, that's what we're saying here. No, <laughs> um, no but I, I, I want to. I want to. I think it would be interesting to talk about like, um, how, how do we? How do we like go from inspiration to constructing something? Oh, interesting. Um, I, if you guys need time to think, I can. I can. I can start. After uh, y'all. I think I kind of touched on this, mm-hmm. but a third trick I came down to is when I start to draw it. Oh, uh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Like, I actually use drawing as a uh, creative exercise. Um, I was even going to say on the inspiration, if this even ties into the inspiration thing, I'm going to uh, paraphrase a uh, quote from Frank Miller, where he once said, as an artist, I asked myself, what do I like to draw? I like to draw, I like to draw hot chicks, fast cars, cool guys in trench coats. So that's what I write about. Hmm. Yeah, so yeah. like I'll start drawing and I think about the stuff that I really want to see or I really enjoy. And then if uh essentially if I start to think like maybe if I can draw it, I can write about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. That's cool. I like yeah. that. Uh for me, I I I I I kind of like really follow the first the first point of inspiration, whether that's like a, a tone, an image, uh, or like even just a monster from like a, like a D monster the one the thing that i want to be like the final boss or whatever um and like I, I just like build around that i like grab things that i think would would be a cool twist or like uh be be like a fun obstacle or something and i take that and i find a way to like mash the things together until it looks interesting um and i kind of like until like uh it becomes something cohesive and then i take this big like blobby mess of things i've thrown together and I try to like shape it into, uh, or like shape it or like focus it into something like uh, cohesive and and like interesting. And then once I've done that, I kind of go in and look at the elements and just be like, how can I make this slightly more interesting? Right. And like like twist it, flip it, bop it, etc. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm not I'm not very good at drawing, so I, I can't really do that. But that I, I like that. That's really cool. I can do the same with like uh, if I draw out like a concept I have. I also like just to like to write words or like uh, as or even as a philosophy buff or like uh, I'll just write out specific words or whatnot or ideas and I'll try to be like, okay, how can what is a theme or idea that really fits with what I'm I was it with what I just drew or what I'm thinking? Like um, when I think space, maybe this just comes from being a uh, 
again, an example being maybe this comes from being a weed knight growing up. But when I think space, I think existentialism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when I think like, uh, I was it or like when I think looking off into the world or like an image like that, that that's kind of where my head goes. Yeah. And then I'm okay. like, I try to think of like, what are themes that I could tie in here? Like something that I actually can try to pontificate. I love the word pontificate. It's a great um, word. <laughs> on uh, it, it, for me, um, I make playlists. That's a that's a big uh, part of my creative, like drive. Is if I have an idea for a movie or a book or anything like that, I'll try to make a playlist that narratively, like musically and musical narratively, uh, I tells the emotions of what I'm thinking for what I want to like execute. So I'll make a playlist typically anywhere from like 12 to like 30 songs and use that at, while I'm writing to uh, motivate me, you know, um, other, other things I'll do is I'll, you know, like, uh, mood boards or image boards and things like that. Um, try to put, I used to do it. I don't really do it anymore, but I used to do like with Pinterest, I'd make Pinterest boards for what I feel like the emotion would be, you know, throwing things on the board and then turning that into other things. I don't do that anymore because the next girlfriend did it. And now I hate that creative process because she did it. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then uh, like, I, like I was saying, uh, part of it is also me just telling you guys about ideas, right? And so I'll come up with something. I'll tell you guys, if you laugh, then I'm like, okay, that's a keeper. And I mean, that's why it's good having Lucas as a friend because he'll chuckle at everything I say. So, <laughs> so I just think everything's a good fucking I mean, idea now. Uh, I, yes, I, I, the George very, Lucas I, tactic. Surround yourself with a yes man. <laughs> I am very easy to make laugh. That is true. <laughs> you just did it right there. It's true. <laughs> so uh, but, I do uh, like... I'm just going to clone Lucas ahead. a few times. Sorry. I was going to say, I do like your playlist one. Yeah. I actually... Uh, I'm kind of trying to do it again because it used to help. But um, I used to just play music around my room back when I lived at home. Yeah. Um, and I would just like kind of walk pace around and think about things or just try to get moods from what I was feeling. Another trick is if I need to get fresh air is I'll just go. I used to just go for a long walk and listen to my iPod. Yeah. And um, then just imagine uh, like, say, if I'm walking down, like under the overpass outside or whatnot, I'm like, what if a meteor just came through and crashed into that? And I'll put change to a song that gives me a vibe like uh, mine of my my buddy Chris has called it baby drivering. OK, <laughs> yeah, he's, like, yeah. he's like, yeah, it's just like you walk around, you play a song and you just imagine movements or sequences. I used to go for longboard rides while listening to music. And that was always like mm. a, a really good thing. Um, I don't do that no more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is an extra 20 pounds well, up yep. the show there's snow outside <laughs> and there's snow I do yeah there's snow uh, something something I, I, I never really thought about the music thing I've, I've never really uh, 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 done that personally but something that I, I like to do when I'm making a and d game is I'll, I'll like set it up in roll 20 and I'll start like making things there and in roll 20 there's the option to like yeah, there's like a little jukebox uh, mm -hmm. thing that you can do and sometimes what I'll do is I'll choose like uh, an ambient sound and like uh either sound effects or music and just like put them on while i'm working yeah uh like for the the city one one that's called the city of stodden um stodden's the uh, th uh theocratic authoritarian uh city in the tundra um what i have playing while i work on that is just uh the sound of just wind blowing as well as gregorian chants okay. at the same time yeah yeah and like that that, that like really sets the tone for what, for what that in the game. dune <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i guess kind of, i guess actually i didn't really think about that but Stoughton has uh some similarities to dune yeah it's funny how you you, in it, some inspiration. you inadvertently listen to music while you you're creative and you didn't even know you did yeah. it right yeah i didn't like sometimes i need music just to like keep my brain focused yeah so i just put on like some like orchestral stuff or something but like yeah i'll, I'll i i didn't really realize it but i do use uh music to establish tone for sure yeah uh, cool. I think we've pretty much touched on quite a bit. I don't know if you guys want to talk, bring up anything else. Yeah. Uh, uh one, one thing I did want to bring up real quick, it won't be too long, but like sometimes for when it comes to 
uh, writing stories. This doesn't apply to making D and D games, but like uh, for for like stories that are, that I intend to be like a screenplay or, screenplay or a novel or something, I will literally map out the events mm -hmm. on a three act structure like map. Yep. Yep. That's which, my... which, mm -hmm, That's, which I find uh, really helpful for like visualizing it. Gotta love the paradigm. Yeah. That's how. Uh... <laughs> Uh, was it that's how I do it at least when I'm teaching um yeah. oh, and yeah. like even just like if I'm taking notes I'll be like okay act one like where do we go I uh, was mm -hmm. it like it's like, like what's um, what's what's each act break what's yeah, the what's point the form, turn like each point it'll be like a scene or a specific detail and then like um I'll write like uh maybe like a line of dialogue or something in there like just as a little like just as a note or whatnot or something that I thought of while the scene was coming up Mm -hmm. Just so I kind of have that in uh, documented somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I used to like to draw it on cards so I could move them around. Yeah, me um, too. Like, uh, or like on little post-it notes. I don't really do that as much anymore just because I found them a mess to keep track of. Yeah, I don't blame you. Um, and um, even just for rule uh, that I've followed is, um, again, this probably comes from watching talks from some of my favorite creators. Like, I always... When writing, I try to follow by the Bud Therefore rule, just because it makes the most sense to me and is easiest to keep track of. Mm -hmm. I've seen like other story. I uh, was it structural. I uh, was it not structures, but like methods of like to get ideas out or whatnot, which I just find overly convoluted. Where you think too much about adhering to that structure. Mm -hmm. Well, part of why I like Bud Therefore is that it's very simple, and it just like and it just works very reasonably in a chain of events. Yeah. Uh, can you explain Bud Therefore? For it, in case anybody doesn't know what that means, are you saying you don't know what it means? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since, I, since I've uh, heard the term. Oh, Liam, so I'm, Liam I'm, froze. I'm struggling a little. Oh no! But therefore, uh, I'll explain. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. That works. Um, uh, yeah. So, oh, oh um, go ahead. Oh, Liam. oh, oh, there he's yes. back. He's back. Yo, uh, but therefore is um, a week called the first time I ever heard it was when I was listening. To, I think I was watching one of the South Park commentaries. And uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker were talking about how, like, when they go to a movie and they start to feel like the way the story's progressing is, and then this happens, and then this happens, they're like, well, what the fuck's going on here? Like, what am I even supposed to follow anymore? Um, If I'm to give an ex... Let's use, uh, just because I know we all like this movie, and it'll maybe help convince some of the idiots online that it actually is good. Um, Star, uh, Star Wars The Last Jedi. Mm -hmm. Movie opens... Uh, what is it? The, uh, what is it? Um, the Empire or First Order is all pissed off because uh, uh, Death Star number three was blown up in the last movie. Therefore, the rebels are uh, uh, was it are trying to get off the planet and just like try to uh, get uh, was it get to uh, hyperdrive. But the Empire has a blockade which is preventing them from getting out and is in their way. Therefore, cool. they send Poe to go and uh, they send Poe Dameron to go try and confront them create a diversion so that they can send bomber, bombers off. But they have a really big-ass ship. That's... Uh... <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, kind of like that. I've... If that makes any sense. That makes perfect, oh, that makes, sense. That makes perfect sense. That was, that was a great description. <laughs> that, was, that was a perfect description. Yeah. And you used great. a good movie. So yeah. <laughs> a good movie that ex actually explains the, the principle very well. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Are we cool. at the tail end here, I believe? I think we are. All right. Um, so that was kind of our discussion about creativity, more so than process, I suppose. Um, but, uh, yeah. If creativity you, and process. Yeah. If you uh, want to drop your description of your creative process down in the comments below here on YouTube or even on our Patreon page, that would be fantastic. We'd love to hear them. Um, when we come back after our break, we're going to be playing a wonderful edition of... Who wars? That's oh, right. We will be right back. Kill switch against the dark. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about Steven I Seagal hate. a lot. I don't know if that's I mean, dangerous. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome back to the show. Um, we're going to be doing a, another edition of Who wars. <laughs> That's right, Cool Wars is a game we like to play at the end of every single episode of the Thundercast in which we pit two characters against each other uh, in a battle of coolness. Liam froze again, oh boy. Uh, oh, great. In which they, they battle in, uh, yeah, coolness. Feel free to d define coolness on your own. They're not physically fighting. Anyway, that's the rules. Um, Liam, 
Put six minutes on the clock. I don't even think we need that much time, but okay. <laughs> All right. Did we say, did we say who, who we're doing? We did not. Who uh, are we doing? Uh, Iron Man versus Napoleon Dynamite. Iron Man versus <laughs> Napoleon Dynamite. What a, what a, what a fucking matchup. All right. And we're rolling. All right. So one of them carries tater tots in his pocket. Mm-hmm. And the other one mm-hmm. is Iron Man. <laughs> one of them has tater tots one of them has weapons of mass destruction that's right see like i mean one of them has nunchucks which are illegal in most states mm, that's true 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 true, yeah. true but the i don't i don't understand why nunchucks are illegal they're not very good weapons but <laughs> what's your point i mean but they, they were very concealable because generally just a stick is better than nunchucks but nunchucks were like are like concealable so that's kind of what made them uh, popular. Yeah, and but Napoleon anyway. has them. Napoleon mm-hmm. has nunchucks. Tony Stark True. relies entirely on his riches and his intellect, his intellect. and his, to build suits. He can't fight on his own. If if you put Tony Stark, he, sort, he, he does a little bit in Iron Man three, but like to a large extent, he does still have some Iron Man suit with him. I think if you put Napoleon with his nunchucks versus Iron Man without a suit, Napoleon wins every time. But again, this is not. A fight. They're not fighting. This is yeah, not not fighting. Fight. Um, since Iron Man keeps coming up, I'm going to make this very clear again. Tony Stark's a totalitarian nut. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I don't even know why why he got into this round. <laughs> into round. I don't two. know cool. because somebody didn't keep track of a document. That someone being me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Iron Man does does get to play ACDC all the time, so that's cool. That's rad as fuck. Yeah, that's yeah, fun. But Ace, it's also everybody loves ACDC, but everybody also should kind of hate ACDC or does kind of hate ACDC. Oh, we'll talk about this on the post show. You... <laughs> <laughs> we'll, I'll meet you that's after threatening. after the show <laughs> in the parking Catch lot. Catch me outside. How about that? Um, uh. <laughs> yeah, Nap- Napoleon's cool because he he kind of has a he he has a don't give a fuck attitude while still caring and being a very empathetic. Mm-hmm. Uh, person but also kind of a fucking sociopath at the same in time. his own way he just in his own way i guess like he helps his best friend he helps his newfound best friend run for class president but he also um is a very negative like uh kind of person yeah and like it's kind of hard to get a gauge if he likes you or not <laughs> yeah that's a good point true you're gonna know if tony stark doesn't like you He's, he's going to tell you. Yeah, he's pretty open with it. I don't like yeah. you anymore, Captain America. I still like you, <laughs> Captain America. <laughs> yeah. Remember the time we fought in an airport? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. And then, then you'll know he likes you again when, when he gives you a shield. And then you're like, okay, we're cool. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Oh, or, you know, when he gives, uh, I was an irresponsible teenager's drone strike summoning glasses. Yeah, mm. that's that's when you know he likes you. <laughs> <laughs> he gives you a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> Napoleon, on the other hand, he'll straight up tell you. He, they're also mm. they're both pretty much open books, you know. Mm. Like, uh, um, I don't know. And Napoleon has sweet dance moves. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my money's still on Napoleon because he's not a uh, to- a totalitarian rich nut. Yeah, are we good to vote now? <laughs> this is quick. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. That was a quick one. Yeah. Three. How many? How much time we got left? Yeah. How much time do we have? Two and a half minutes. Oh yeah, no, we're good. <laughs> Ready? Three. Two, Two, one, one. Napoleon. Napoleon. <laughs> yeah, We're such losers. <laughs> yeah, we suck. <laughs> anyway. Hey, maybe we're the kind of losers Napoleon would like. Maybe. Probably. Maybe. Could you imagine Napoleon was on our show? <laughs> Just like, yeah. He would was... drop a lot of facts about ligers to us, even though ligers <laughs> are abominations of nature. Yeah. <laughs> Does Lucas have large talons? <laughs> Does Lucas no, have an uncle? Is Lucas's dad like Uncle Rico? <laughs> Thing is, I, I, I don't, I, I still don't think I've seen all of the Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, if you, by cultural osmosis, you definitely. Oh yeah, have. By cultural osmosis. I've, I've absorbed a lot of it. Yeah, but I don't think I've ever actually watched the movie all the way through. Yeah, I've seen pretty big chunks of it. Uh, but I don't really remember. Like, is there a plot in that movie? I can't remember. Not really. Not really. Okay, it's kind of a hangout movie. Um, but Lucas, do you want to take us out? Sure. 
Uh, well, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please uh, follow us on social media. We are Thunder Lizard Collective uh, in most places like uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and, um, and uh, YouTube. Uh, we are Thunder Lizard OG on Twitter. Uh, so follow us on there. Uh, rate us five stars on whatever podcatcher you use. Uh, and then give us a follow if you don't mind, especially on like Spotify and stuff like that. Uh, big shout out to our patrons, who I think Christian has the names of. I, I, I should probably know the names by now. Yeah, you'd think, <laughs> right? I still have it written on a note, so. Yeah. <laughs> Kate, Kate, Tanya. Tanya knows Tanya, Tanya and Owen. That's right, Kate. Kate, there Tanya, you go. Well, and Owen. Thank you very much for giving us uh, your money. Yes, and we have another show, which we already talked about in this episode, but we'll talk about it again. There's Thunder and Dragons, a Thunder, uh, a Dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons actual play podcast with me as the Dungeon Master, with uh, Christian Liam and our friend Dan uh, as the as the adventurers, the players. Uh, was there anything else? Nope. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much for listening, buddy. <laughs> yes, this has been the Thundercast for this week. My name is Christian. My name is Lucas. And I'm Liam. See ya. <laughs> also i just i just saw one of the latest comments thunder lizard collective saying pope skeet is the only pope <laughs> <laughs> i wonder who wrote that